Okay, we are exploring the epistles of Peter. And these are colorful epistles, because here's one of the most colorful characters in the New Testament. Of all the disciples, the one we all, I think, feel the most comfortable with is this character we call Peter, Simon Peter. And um, so we enjoy his uh, antics all through the Gospels, sometimes right and sometimes wrong, but always colorful. And uh, so uh, he's written two letters. And he also had two events in his life that really seemed to have impressed him. The encounter, at, uh, encounter if you will, at uh, Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And the other one that will dominate his thinking in the second letter was the transfiguration. Those two events are obviously very much on his mind. And they'll sh they'll, they lie just under the text all the way through. So we are in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's just jump right on in. He continues saying, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. Now you may recall we touched on this verse in the last session because we had chapter 1 but we picked this one verse just to bridge. So we've talked about this last time. The wherefore, of course, ties this verse to the previous chapter. And understand the chapter divisions were 13th century editions. So this, the scripture uh, endured for a long time without chapters and verses. Uh, Stephen Langton is credited with having divided it that, in the way that we know it today. So don't uh, uh, let the chapter divisions, don't presume that they're necessarily the best place. They're, they're adequate probably, but there's many times you want to sort of ignore the chapter divisions and realize they're bridges all the way through. So this derives from the previous chapter. And uh, repentance is called for here. Uh, Peter now lists five sins of attitude and speech. Boy, how much of our life really is impacted by our attitude and especially our speech. That, uh, that covers a multitude of our report card right there. And so it's the sins of attitude and speech that divide. One, his, con his concern here, Peter's concern, is how it, it drives a wedge between us as believers, in our churches, in our fellowships. And uh, so he's saying, the first one, laying aside all malice. Well, that sounds pretty good. What does that really mean? Well, the Greek verb here expresses, it's used in the sense of getting rid of a garment, taking off your coat or whatever, putting off all malice. Like what he's really saying, putting off the old self, to use what you might say, uh, you know, a Pauline phrase. That's the way Paul would probably express it. The word malice there, kakein, is a, a wicked ill will. That's a pretty straightforward word. I think we have a feeling for that. It involves the desire to inflict pain, harm, or injury on our fellow man. So malice includes intent. Not just injury, but intent, if you will. Okay. So, and I want you to notice all is in here three times. All malice, all guile, all evil speakings. In other words, no exceptions. As we talk about each one of these things, Peter is suggesting that we should get rid of all of it, not allow any of this in our lives. Laying aside all malice, if you will. And all guile. How does guile differ from malice? Well, guile is deceit. It's deliberate dishonesty, falsehood, craft, seduction, slander, treachery. And uh, in practical terms, it's the opposite of being a fiduciary. Now, that's a term that you probably don't normally use. It is used among lawyers. It's used among executives of large corporations because a manager or a director is the fiduciary of the shareholders, all of them, not just their constituent interest. In other words, if a certain stockholder group puts you on the board, your duty isn't just to them, it's to all the shareholders. And you, you have to put the interests of the corporation ahead of your own. That's what the word fiduciary means. That's the relationship between a doctor and a patient. That's the relationship between an attorney and a client, and so on. Fiduciary. And that becomes very important when you study Ephesians 6 and other passages, because as an employee of a company in general, our duties involve giving 60 minutes work for 60 minutes paid. You work from 8 to 5, your duties expire at 5 o'clock. They don't pick up again till 8 o'clock next morning. That's if you're a normal employee. If you're a manager or a director, 
You're a fiduciary even in your off hours. You're required to look out for the interests of that corporation if you're a manager or director, protecting their shareholder list, protecting their trade secrets, that sort of thing. Well, if you are a regular employee, that may not apply to you unless you're a Christian. But Paul points out that if you're a Christian, you own your employer a fiduciary responsibility. And that's a, that's a concept that's not widely taught, but needs to be. That, uh, because Paul talks about your, your obligations to your master. Bear in mind, they had a, a different economy. We have employees and employers. Um, but the point is, is that uh, you can study that in Ephesians 6 if you want to get into it. But uh, this is, guile is the opposite of being a fiduciary. And uh, so, now deceit and, hypo uh, and hypocrisies are twins. By deceit, a person is wronged, but by hypocrisy, he is deceived. They're very, very closely related. Hypocrisies and envies. Uh, Hypocrisies, the uh, uh, pretended piety and love. Pretending to be what one is not. A man with a double heart and a lying tongue, in other words. And Jesus quoted Isaiah to the Pharisees in this regard, by the way. That uh, beware the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and so on. The word envy is a, a, a different kind of a word. It's resentful discontent. Uh, both hypocrisy and envy appear to be plural in the Greek, by the way. In the Greek presentation here, and it is in the English translation also, they're in the plural. Hypocrisies. Envies. It's not just a singular thing. It's a collection of these things. Okay. And all evil speakings. Now, I'm not going to repeat what we did last time. We touched on, this is all by way of review, because we took this first verse in the last session, and under evil speakings, we did a little uh, sidebar, if you will, on the most painful sin. Of all the sins, what's, the mo what's caused most pain on the planet Earth? My suggestion, the possibility, is that it's gossip, slander. That's probably caused more pain than any one of the other sins. And uh, that matter of an opinion, but that's evil speaking, slander, or backbiting lies, if you will. Tetatelios. And uh, none of these should have any place among those who are born again. We are not to gossip. You understand how Christians gossip? It, you know, in order that you pray, for, you, you can pray more carefully for so-and-so, let me tell you what's really going on, so that you can pray for him more. Baloney. Don't pass on gossip. The fact that it's true or untrue is not the issue. It's not the issue. Evil speaking. Rather than that, in obedience to the Word of God, believers should make a decided break with their past. You want to shut that down. Not only do you not pass it along, you don't entertain it. You don't entertain it. So, be as eager um, for the nourishment of the Word as babies are with the milk. Because the next verse, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. S the sincere, or unadulterated, is what the Word really means. Milk of the Word. It's interesting that Peter here is emphasizing the basics. The milk of the Word. That's in contrast to Paul's letter to the Hebrews, in which he scolds them for limiting themselves to the milk of the Word and not dealing with strong food, the meat of the Word. And I'll leave it to you to go ahead and study what the difference is. And uh, it's interesting, though, Peter's treating his readers like newborn babes. In other words, their life depends upon the next feeding. That's probably true of all of us. We all need a, a continual a diet. After believers cast out the impure desires and motives that we talked about in verse 1, they need to feed on wholesome spiritual food that produces growth. The word sincere, unadulterated, if you will, is deliberately contrasted with the word deceit. Get rid of deceit, but replace it with the sincere milk of the word. God's Word does not deceive, neither should God's children deceive. God's Word is pure. 
And that's a whole thing to really study, by the way. You might want to collect those verses in Psalm 119 and several other places that emphasize that God's Word is straightforward, it's pure, it's without um, uh, mixture. It's, it's straight. And uh, that's one of the reasons you want to be cautious about paraphrases. It's very popular today to read a, not a translation of the Bible, but a paraphrase of the Bible. And they're comfortable for many reasons. I'm not going to discourage that, but understand the difference. And um, I remember Walter Martin leaning over the pulpit and saying, you would paraphrase God? <laughs> yeah, you, you miss a lot. The paraphrases are readable and they're enjoyable for many devotional purposes probably, but be careful because they also miss uh, often what God is really saying. Christians should approach the Word with clean hearts and minds in eager anticipation and a desire to grow. Every time you open your Bible, you should do it with a word of prayer. He continues, Peter says, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And he's quoting here Psalm 34, 8. He continues the, the milk analogy that he started in verse 2. He likened their present knowledge of Christ to tasting. You taste Christ. Interesting expression. Something about Peter, he's real. You know, his feet are on the ground. He tastes the word. And... Uh, they had taken a sample, they experienced God's grace in their new birth, and found that God is gracious. So you've, you have learned that. If you've, if you've tasted God, you understand what he's talking about here. He continues, To whom coming as unto a living stone. Now that's a strange metaphor, isn't it? A living stone? We don't think of stones as living, do we? most unliving thing you think, a rock, a stone. No, he's using an idiom here. It's very unusual. To him coming as unto a living stone. And he talks a lot about this stone. And your assignment you can carry away from this morning is to conduct your own study of the Bible from cover to cover. Skim through it with concordance. And notice how often stone or rock is used metaphorically and always of, strangely enough, Christ. Okay? Livingstone, disallowed indeed of men. Wasn't Christ rejected by his generation? Absolutely. But chosen of God and is precious. He's going to, we're going to elaborate this a little bit. A living stone. Now, one reason this comes up here, and I want to highlight this to you. When you study Matthew 16 and the, the uh, encounter at Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus says, uh, uh, you know, wh whom, whom do men say that I am? Well, whom do you say that I am? Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Je that's his finest moment. You know? and, and Jesus says, uh, Upon this stone I will build my church. And all kinds of groups, Catholics in particular, but others have also felt that that refers to Peter as the first pope and that sort of thing. No, he's referring to himself, actually. And the guy that... There's a lot of different views about Matthew 16, what Jesus meant by that. I'm going to suggest that the guide should be Peter. He was there. And he talks about it here. And the stone he's talking about isn't Peter. It's Christ. Okay? And uh, so uh, he, he, let's understand it how Peter understood these things. The rock is Christ himself. He's the living stone. And we can be living stones in that we reflect him. Okay? So every believer is also a living stone made such by grace. But the root idiom, the focus idiom, is the rock that is Christ. Paul even says so in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. When, we're, when we read in Numbers and so forth, the, where they came to the rock in the wilderness, and, and, and uh, the rock was struck by Moses, and out came the living water. Paul identifies that as a type by saying that rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And it happens twice. The first time he's told to strike the rock, and he does, and the water comes out. The second time, at Rephidim, Paul, uh, uh, Jesus tells Moses to speak to the rock. But Moses is really upset, so he strikes the rock a second time, and God is upset with him. He calls him aside. You didn't represent me faithfully. You gave them the impression that I was angry. He wasn't angry. And because of that, Moses did not inherit that's a shocker. He spent 120 years 
40 before he left Egypt, then 40 years in the backside of the desert with Yvonne de Carlo there and all that, and then 40 years leading through the wilderness. He was 120 years at, in service, and he's in the penalty box. He dies able to see the promised land but not enter it, which was his inheritance. He didn't get to inherit don't feel too sorry for him because he's not through yet. Because he was at the staff meeting in Matthew 17, we call the Transfiguration, and I suspect that he's one of the two witnesses, and he and Elijah have unfinished business that takes care of in Revelation chapter 11. So he's, he's, he's going to do all right. But the point is, um, it's important to take God seriously. And he didn't follow God's direction. If he had... Then the rock, those two rock experiences, would describe the first and second coming, smitten in the first one and in glory in the second. But anyway, to whom coming, the participle here, the tense and voice, indicate that this coming is a personal, habitual approach. It's an intimate association of communion and fellowship between believers and their Lord. So when he says, to whom coming, that's what he's talking about here. It's the tense and voice, uh, personal intimate, habitual. Peter is going to develop and explain this metaphor of the stone in the coming verses. So this, this chapter has a lot to do with what do we mean by this peculiar phrase, a living stone. A living stone. He said the stone's living. It has life in itself and gives life to others. That's why he's using this phrase. Stones don't normally do that. His metaphor does here. And the people can enter into personal vital relationships with this living stone. So Peter's going to use this in several different ways as a unique figure of speech. He's going to refer to it as a living hope, in verse, and, and he already has. And he's going to, uh, and he, last, in the last chapter, he referred to the living word, and here he refers to Christ as the living stone. Now this stone was disallowed by men, but chosen of God. Christ was disallowed and rejected by men. God had chosen him, that was pointed out in the last chapter, and God held him as precious, both here and in the past and here and another, in a couple more verses again. And chosen and precious. And Christians rejected the, uh, by the world may take heart in the knowledge that they are elect and valued by God. Understand something, by the way. We live in a time where I think we're going to, many Christians are going to wake up in shock because we're going to be rejected by the world. Christians always have been, but not in our peculiar heritage. For a couple of centuries here, we've had a God-fearing culture that was founded on the Word of God originally. It, we've migrated away from that. And Christians here in America are in for a rude shock as they wake up to the reality that if you're a biblical believer, you're going to be politically incorrect. There are all kinds of false religions you can identify with. There's all kinds of apostate churches you can attend. But find a church that preaches the Word of God, that preaches the blood of Christ, etc. You're going to find a few and far between, and if you attend those, you're going to be considered weird. You're one of those fundamentalist nuts. I'll sign up for that label any day. And so, believers identified with Christ for he is the living, are also considered living stones. If you identify with Christ and he's a living stone, then you're going to, that's what Peter is in effect using that phrase here. And as they become more like Christ, as you be, you become like the thing you worship. Don't forget that. Several times in the Psalms, it points out, you become like what you worship. Is the world cold and unforgiving? If you worship the world, you'll become cold and unforgiving, materialistic. Whatever you're worshiping, you'll become like that. That's why it's important to worship Christ, because if you do, you'll become more like Him. Because you're being built into a spiritual house, Peter suggests here. And Jesus told Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And I personally suspect he was pointing to himself, he was gesturing to himself. Now Peter clearly identifies Christ as the rock on which this church is built, both in the last verse, verse 4 and 5 of 1 Peter 2. Peter called the church a temple and a dwelling. Believers not only make up the church, but serve in it, ministering a holy priesthood and offering spiritual sacrifices. So the analogy is complete. By the way, seven times in the New Testament, it speaks of us 
as being a temple. You are the temple of God. Well, and that could be simply in the sense, well, he didn't, because the Holy Spirit indwells us as, new, as believers, it may mean much more than that. I believe it, it speaks to the architecture of the human uh, software. Not the hardware. That's, we're going to get rid of that. We're going we're to have a body transplant here when time comes. But the software architecture is described by the architecture of the temple. It's a great study. I encourage you to get into it. We have a thing called the architecture of man that gets into that. My wife's done a book on it. We have agape that deals with it and so on. All believers are priests, by the way. And that's going to come up here, uh, obviously, in 1 Peter 2.9. But it's also in Revelation 4, uh, uh, 1 and Hebrews 4 and elsewhere. Believers are priests. In fact, there are three people... Only three people in the, in the Bible that are priests and kings together. In Israel, kings and priests were separate. Kings of the tribe of Judah, priests of the tribe of Levi. They were separate. Melchizedek was unique in that he was king and a priest. And that would be sort of a technicality except for Psalm 110 and Hebrews 5 and others where the writer, the scripture itself, makes a point of the fact that Jesus Christ is a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So there's three, Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and who's the third? You and me. We are kings and priests. Peter so describes it here, and it's critical for your understanding of Revelation 5 and on to understand who the 24 elders are, because they identify who they, they are, despite a lot of people writing about it that get confused. They make it quite clear who they are. They're kings and priests. They are the redeemed. They rep the four, 24 represent, collectively, the, the, the uh, redeemed and need no other mediator than Jesus Christ to approach God directly. He's our high priest, in other words. So, uh, we're a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. We're to offer sacrifices. That's what priests do, by the way, is offer sacrifices. And uh, before the law was given, the, ho the head of the house was the priest of the house. After we get into the, the when they failed under the law, we, it was relegated to the Levitical priests. In the, Melchi in the uh, millennial temple described in Ezekiel 40 through 48, the Levites are relegated to routine service, not being priests at all. It has to be the sons of Zadok, and it's a very different situation there. Interesting to study. But we, we need to give sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And priestly service requires holiness. So if we're going to be a priest, a holy priesthood, we need to aspire to holiness. And praise to God and doing good to others are the spiritual sacrifices we're talking about here. Hebrews 13 deals with that. But we should also be offering ourselves, if you will, as living sacrifices. And Romans, the first two verses of Romans 12 are the classic passages on that. Okay. Peter continues, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, and he's now quoting, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now suddenly this stone idiom is reflected in a little different way. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. What on earth is a cornerstone? Well, it's a keystone. It's a very important stone. Okay. Elect and precious. He that believeth on him, on what? Him, the stone. Who's him? Christ. Shall not be confounded. The chief cornerstone. Now, he's quoting from three Old Testament passages, Isaiah 28, verse 6, Psalm 118, 22, Isaiah 8, 14, and Isaiah 28, 16. The, the four different times in, um, I, uh, 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 three times in Isaiah and once in Psalms, we have uh, these quotes, where Christ is chosen and precious, and uh, he's the cornerstone. See, now, a cornerstone is that visible part which is intended to represent what the whole building uh, stands on, if you will. Now, obviously, it's on the corner, but it is representative then of the whole building is the idea. But I, uh, Psalm 118.22 is perhaps the key passage here for a number of reasons I'll come to in a minute. Um, but whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, in the Greek, they have a double negative here. Now, in English, if you have a double negative, it reverses, you know. You can't go there no more. Well, that's not a good example. Anyway, the point is, a double negative is something in, in English grammar you want to avoid because it reverses itself. In Greek, it's 
It works differently. A double negative is intensive. That means it's really no. You follow me? Negative. Okay. And it's, uh, it's here in the subjective mood, which indicates an emphatic negative assertion uh, uh, that uh, refers to the future. Never indeed shall they be shamed, is really what the Greek says. Shall not be confounded. Well, never, never indeed, ever, is the way it might have been better translated. So Peter encourages readers uh, with a sure scriptural promise of ultimate victory for those who trust in Christ. That's not a surprise to this audience. Let's move on. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Here he's reconciling those two idioms, if you will. On the one hand, he's the stone which the builders disallowed. He's referring to the rejection by the Pharisees and whatever. And yet, he's now going to show up as the headstone of the corner. Now, this, 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 these verses present a sharp contrast between those who believe and those who do not. We do need to understand you're in one camp or the other. You know, the, the, the Paul, speaks of, Paul speaks of the that uh, the scriptures uh, foolishness to them who are to them who perish you either perish or you don't perish do you believe the scripture or don't you that's really it's a division there isn't any gray this is one of those binary digital situations those who believe and those who do not there's a contrast Christ is precious of ultimate value to those who believe but if you don't believe if you rejected Christ you'll stumble because of disobedience now, the second quotation that he uses here is from Psalm 118.22. Uh, I want to come back to this one because uh, this was he, Jesus himself. Peter was present when Jesus applied this verse to himself in Matthew 21. Uh, his rejection by the chief priests and the Pharisees. Let's take a look at that. Matthew 21, starting about verse 42. Jesus said unto him, Did you never read in the Scriptures? He's quoting. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is, mar is, it, it is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. Jesus then explains his quoting that verse from the Psalms. He says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is a shocking verse. Jesus is saying that the kingdom is being taken away from you, Israel, and given to others that will bring forth fruit. That's heavy stuff. Many people don't realize. Now, if you've been studying Matthew carefully, you know it's from chapter 12. That's when they rejected him. From chapter 13 on in Matthew, he no longer speaks ex publicly except in parables, so they won't understand. And he explains those parables only in private to his disciples. You need to understand that to really understand what's going on in Matthew. But in any case, uh, here again he reiterates, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. He continues, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Have you been broken? Have you been fallen on the stone that, uh, what is the stone here? Jesus Christ. Who shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but whomsoever, on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's your choice. To fall on him and be broken? Denying self, exchanging your life for his, or ultimately that stone will grind you to powder. That's what he's implying here, literally. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they, they perceived that he spake of them. Your comment on that is no kidding, Dick Tracy. <laughs> when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I love that. I love that. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. They were pl plotting his death way back, even in chapter 12. They were not planning to take him on the Passover. Not on a feast day. That was their plan. But most people don't realize he forced their hand to take it that night at the Lord's Supper. He said he announced that Judas was going to betray him. The cat was out of the bag. What Judas had to do, he had to do then or fish or cut bait. What they do is do quickly. He forced their hand. Why? Because he was on a schedule. Every detail 
from the Lord's Supper on, in Gethsemane, everything was, he was in control. That's a shock to discover. Study it yourself, come to your own conclusions. Let's move on. Peter continues, verse 8, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, wherefore, whereunto also they were appointed. Wow. They were being disobedient. This is the third quotation from Isaiah 8.14. The rejection of Jesus Christ is fatal and is connected with the disobeying of the message of God's word. To disobey the message is to reject it and to obey it is to believe. And uh, obedience uh, in several places is obedient to faith. But uh, that's a very key concept. That's a very key concept. If you've rejected Jesus Christ, that can be fatal. All who do not receive Christ as their Savior will one day face Him as the judge. Because before Him every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. And because of sin, all disobedient unbelievers are destined for a stumbling which will lead to eternal condemnation. You'd love to escape that truth. You can't. The Word of God is very clear on those issues. And by the way, one of the studies I commend to you, you might put in your notes, the term stone or rock in the Scripture, cover to cover, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, are idioms of the Holy Spirit throughout the Scripture, or uh, as it resident, uh, you know, uh, uh, or, or Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 10:4, the rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. Christ the rock, smitten that the Spirit of life may flow from Him unto all who drink. That's the type of it from uh, uh, Exodus 17:6 where the rock was thrown, the water came out. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul nails this and identifies it for you. John 4 and John 7, the, the, the river of life speeches deal with this. A second verse is chief cornerstone. To the church, this rock is the foundation and chief cornerstone, and so identified in Ephesians 2, 20. To the Jews, at his first coming especially, it's a stumbling stone. And Paul deals with that in Romans 9, and Paul deals with 1 Corinthians 1. To Israel, on a national basis, at his second coming, it'll be the headstone of the corner. Wow. That'll be exciting. Zechariah 4, 7. I got seven of these, if you want to make a list. To the Gentile world, the Gentile world power, who's in charge of that, by the way? Satan, the smiting stone, stone cut without hands. Remember in Daniel 2, the stone that was cut without hands. That was a supernatural stone, not cut with hands. And from the point of view of the divine purpose, that stone, after the destruction of the Gentile powers, is to grow and fill the whole earth. Remember in that image, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. Daniel's interpreting for him. He had all these, he had this many metal images, gold, silver, brass, iron, iron mixed with clay. A stone smites it, and it all crumbles, blows away, and that stone cut without hands grows to be a mountain that fills the whole earth. The mountain is a government. There's going to be a fifth kingdom. You had four kingdoms there. Gold, silver, brass, and iron, right? Iron in two different kinds, but still iron. There's a fifth kingdom. The kingdom of not God, that's everything, kingdom from heaven. Distinguishing term. Matthew makes a denotative term, kingdom from heaven, in contrast to the kingdom of God. Mark, Luke, and John use the term kingdom of God. Only one writer uses kingdom from heaven. That's Matthew. And it gets misunderstood. It's kingdom of heaven, you get confused. In the Hebrew and in German, of and from are the same word. It's the kingdom from heaven. It's on the earth. It has a capital. It's a tangible. It's a physical kingdom. It's like the others. It's the fifth in that series of five. And Jesus Christ is going to rule from a throne in, Jer in uh, Jerusalem. That's what Gabriel told Mary when he announced the birth, that he would sit on the throne of David. And that was predicted all through the scripture. So, this stone is going to destroy the Gentile world powers. And it's going to grow and fill the whole earth. It's a global, worldwide, thousand-year reign that is distinguished by Satan being bound for those thousand years. Now, to the unbelievers, this same stone is a crushing stone of judgment that will grind them to powder. That's what Jesus pointed out to them in Matthew 21. So those seven elements, you can make more. Those are few. Okay, 
We've been, the, 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 Peter's first letter has three sections in it. The first section is what we've talked to till now. That's the first section of his letter. The second section is the sevenfold position we're going to deal with from the next verse through chapter, part of chapter, you know, through chapter four. And then the last part of the letter will be the last chapter, chapter five. So we've, look, we've just gone through what uh, many uh, highlight as, as the first section of the epistle. We're now going to move into the core of it. This has all been a warm-up, okay? From verse 9 of chapter 2 through uh, chapter 4. So let's continue. But ye are a chosen generation. Did you realize that? Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Wow! If you really understand that biblically, being royal and being a priesthood are usually contradictions. That sounds like an oxymoron. No, no, no. Royal priesthood. Melchizedek, Christ, and the believer. A holy nation. A peculiar people. I think most of us realize we're a peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. He closes this portion, if you will, this previous section, by encouragement. And there's a moving exhortation here to practice holiness. He reminds them that in contrast with the disobedient who are destined for destruction, you are chosen people. You're to be distinguished from them. And uh, so he echoes the Old Testament, especially, this is a, really a quote from Isaiah 43.20. Chosen people. That used to apply just as the chosen people refers to Israel, to the Jews. Not anymore. That's what. Now here's Peter, whose mandate is to write to the Jews. Paul took the Gentiles, Peter took the Jews. So he's used to dealing with the Jews. But he's acknowledging here that you as Gentile believers are also now included in that term as being chosen. We, he chose us before we chose him. So, okay. There was a responsibility at one time entrusted totally to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. God told Moses to tell the people, quote, you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 19.6. That was the mandate. Did, but they had to hold themselves obedient to the law. Did they? No. They blew it. So that responsibility was then focused, modified and focused on, Le on the Levitical priests. Now during this age of grace, the relationship has been given to the church. Believers in the church are called a holy priesthood, 1 Peter 2.5, you recall, a royal priesthood here, and also in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, it picks up on that same idea. A people belonging to God. That's you and I, non-Jewish, Gentiles, that we're talking about. That's, uh, that's all through the scripture too, of course. Now the Messiah himself was prophesied to be both a priest and a king. There's that contradiction in a royal priesthood. The Messiah is our example. He is, and we are through him. That's, that's not new. That's, that's, that's Zechariah 6. And of course, echoed in, in uh, Hebrews 7 and in Revelation, first chapter. Now, some of these descriptions, let me give you a caution flag here. Some of these descriptions of the church are similar to the, uh, Israel, the descriptions of Israel in the Old Testament. But that does not mean the church replaces Israel. That's where people stumble and get confused. The fact that they're similar doesn't mean they're the same. Similarity does not mean identity. Okay? And so uh, uh, there are national blessings that have been promised to Israel that are not the churches, they're Israel's, and they will be fulfilled. The church and Israel have different origins, different missions, different destinies. You need to understand that. Keep those distinct. But there are some parallels, and that's what we're seeing here. That ye should, why? So that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness. How do you show forth praises? By our walk. That's our most important witness. Not the tracks we pass out, our walk. God's purpose in choosing believers for himself so that they may declare his praises of him before others. Now the word praises here could be translated eminent qualities, excellence, or virtues. It's the quality of your life, the quality of your walk that is your primary manner of showing forth praise to the God that calls you. 
Mahatma Gandhi was asked what's the, what, what he felt was the biggest barrier to Christianity in India. His answer was Christians. The way Christians behave is a block to many that would otherwise be won over because they see the hypocrisy, the foolishness, the lack. They, they, they make extraordinary claims living ordinary lives. No, that's not what the deal is. Believer priests should be lived so that their Heavenly Father's qualities are evident in their lives. They're to serve as witnesses of the glory and grace of God, who call them what? Out of darkness into light. Does your walk, does your personal life demonstrate to your neighbors and friends that you've been called out of darkness into light? It's supposed to. Now, Peter explains this in his next figure. He's going to quote from Hosea, chapter 2, verse 2, 23. But ye are a chosen uh, 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 generation, a royal priest, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Darkness here refers to the time when readers were pagans. When the readers of Peter's letter were pagans, ignorant of God's provision of salvation. When they were not a people, they had not received mercy. In other words, in, in Hosea, it makes that difference. You're not my people. The marvelous light illumines the people of God because they have received Him. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, and now have obtained mercy. Practice of holiness in which God's people serve as holy and royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice and extolling His excellencies, is the proper response to the mercy they've received. So it should be offering spiritual sacrifice of a life. Your life should be your sacrifice to manifest the God that called you. Now in the next section here that we're getting into, the specific ways Christians should behave differently before the world as citizens, as slaves, and as wives, and as husbands. Citizens, slaves, wives, and husbands. And uh, even in familiar situations, their conduct should be discernibly different. Any situation you find yourself in, the most routine, routine should manifest a distinction that would be discerned by the unbeliever. That's quite, a, that's quite an issue. Is it manifest? First Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. I beseech you as strangers. That's one of the first questions we should be asking ourselves. Do we really behave as strangers or are we earth dwellers? In the scripture you'll notice there's a contrast. Abraham... But his citizenship wasn't of this world. He looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. And the book of Revelation contrasts the earth dwellers who are the ones that are dwelling on the earth. We're, we're not. We're just passing through. So the, uh, those who are loved by God are exhorted to live as strangers. or uh, The word is actually aliens. Herakos, which is uh, those who live in a place that is not their home. And it's used, of course, figuratively here of Christians whose real home is in heaven. And pilgrims, strangers in the world, that's the idea here. I hope that's, you know, that's easily said, but do we really live that way? You know, I find myself, um, with all the changes going on in our country, hard to let go of our heritage. I spent 30 years in the strategic arena, and uh, uh, what I used to regard as patriotism, I now look back as a form of idol worship. It's very, very, uh, very, very, you know, when I was a kid, Boy Scouts, it was God and country. You didn't have to choose between them. And now we find ourselves increasingly having to be more discerning. And uh, now, no one is really a pilgrim in the biblical sense who has not first become a stranger to this world. Are you a stranger to this world? You know, as a practicing executive and a builder of companies and whatever, I spent 30 years in the public boardroom. Uh, I was very much trying to stay in tune with what I regard as the real world, the world of business and corporations. And, and uh, yes, I taught Bible studies and held Christ as my Savior, and yet uh, I look back and realize that it took me a while to really be estranged from the world as such. And so... Uh, so just as our Christian values and beliefs are rejected and increasingly so by the world, so we are supposed to live apart from immorality and sinful desires that surround them. There's a whole 
standard practice among many we need to shun, stay away from, put distance from. We are to abstain from fleshly lusts. And uh, what the Greek uh, term actually says is to hold oneself constantly back from. And uh, we are to uh, resist the sinward pull of worldly desires, which war against the spiritual lives. Covetousness, all kinds. Abstain from fleshly lusts. You know, you never cast out the flesh, do we? You can cast out demons, you can cast out Satan, you can fight him in many ways. You can't, the, 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 the flesh stays with us. It's a continual battle that doesn't cease. And uh, this is a real spiritual battle. And uh, the demon, demonic strategies attack believers at their weakest point. Now I might amend that slightly. I suspect it also attacks us at our strongest point. What was Peter's strongest point? Boldness, right? And yet it was that boldness that got him in trouble. Again and again. Having your conversation, now bear in mind, this is the old English term conversation, which really we would use the term today of behavior. Today conversation to us just means talk. The original old English word meant our whole way of life. Having your conversation, your whole, the way you conduct yourself. Have it honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now the negative kind of exhortation of the previous verse is now followed by a positive instruction. You're not only supposed to abstain from sinful desires, uh, not only for your own spiritual well-being, but also in order to maintain an effective testimony. So your abstaining from freshly lust has to do not just for your own welfare, but for your witness to others. And to maintain a positive testimony. A positive Christian lifestyle is a powerful means of convicting the world of its sin. And the most powerful indictment of Christianity by the Muslims is our sinfulness. They would make a pretense of being, you know, they don't, staying away from alcohol and certain kind of practice, they would argue, they would try to advance that as a, a means of conviction. Well, there's some legitimacy in those, in those indictments. Because the Christian world, Christian lifestyle, tragically isn't as distinct as it should be. Having your, your, your conversation honest. The word good here is used twice in the same word, uh, both their lives and their works. See, it's, you have your conversation honest is having your, your, your life uh, good, in a word, and your works good. It's, it's actually the same word in the Greek in both places there. Before the critical eyes of slanderous people and their false accusations, the good deeds of believers can glorify God. The people can make all the lies they want about you. If you're living a demonstrably pure life, that's the best rebuttal you can give. In the day of visitation, this is speaking of God's presence among men, the office, place, service, office of bishop. The time of your visitation is also Luke 19, 44. They had their time of visitation when they had the chance to accept him while he rode that donkey into Jerusalem. And he wept over them because they had rejected him. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. See, Christians are responsible to obey the law. You may not like the law, but part of your witness is to obey the law. A good friend of mine had a very active ministry, but uh, is serving in prison for tax evasion. And uh, it's interesting, many of us who are his friends tried to warn him that he's fighting the wrong battle. Jesus was confronted with a tax that he didn't need to pay. He asked Peter, who is it residents or strangers that this tax is for? Well, not strangers. I mean, they were residents. Nevertheless, go to this fish, get a coin, pay it. 
to keep the peace. Many people missed the point. That was not a tax they were liable for. They could have missed that, skipped that one. They paid it so they'd be without reproach. That doesn't mean you have to pay taxes you're not eligible for, but you certainly do need to pay the taxes you are eligible for, and to fight those things is to fight the wrong battle. How tragic. Christians are responsible to obey the law. Because the laws are good? No. They may not be. But that's part of your conduct. Every ordinance of man. And so Peter exhorted his, his readers to abide by governmental laws, to submit to every ordinance of man. And uh, here it's literally the institution or creation of the law, and it's made by man. A human, the human, these are human laws. We're not talking about God's laws here. He's focusing on the ordinance of men. Keep off the grass, whatever. The, motiv the motivation for obedience is not avoiding punishment. It's for the Lord's sake. It's not that you're going to be thrown in jail for that. It's that you're, you're giving a witness. That's, his, that's the point that Peter's trying to make here. To honor God who ordained human government. Christians are to observe man-made laws carefully as long as those laws do not conflict with the clear teaching of Scripture. Now, there is a gray area here. What happens when those laws are direct conflict with what the Bible teaches? Then you've got a problem. So there are places where rebellion is sanctified, even though it may lead to your death. But that's not, you see, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king is supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. This section of Peter's argument leads many to believe that, that the organized persecution through oppressive Roman laws either not yet begun or not reached the, the provinces of Asia Minor. He's in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey. We're not in that era yet under Nero where there's real oppression by the Roman government. The Romans, give them their due, brought order to a disorderly world. Before you're too harsh on their judgment, realize what a rough-and-tumble world it was that they tamed. And they established Pax Roma. They actually created an administration that allowed roads to be built, commerce to take place, and so forth. And they, in a sense, put a context in place so that the gospel could go throughout the world. Alexander came along and unified the language for enforced Greek as the international language. Fantastic. One of the most precise languages on the planet Earth. Greek. The Koine Greek. The Romans then succeed and on that foundation built roads and communication and an infrastructure and a, and a commerce that caused it to be possible to travel throughout Asia. Paul could go to commercial centers and, and, and spread the gospel. The combination of the universal language and a universal political structure set the stage for the church, strangely enough. And so, uh, so the, yes, indeed, those laws became oppressive, as it always does under tyranny, and it did. But that's, you know, this implies this is an era or an instruction ahead of Nero and all of that uh, uh, that followed. Christians were then facing lies and verbal abuse, not torture and death. Christians were still enjoying the protection of a legal system which commend, uh, commended those who obeyed the law. The Romans give them their credit. All they wanted is have it quiet. That got them upset is when there were insurrections of whatever reason. And the way Paul's enemies would raise trouble is to go to the Roman authorities and try to accuse Paul of creating unrest. That would raise the alarm among the, the Roman administrators. And uh, so that was, you understand that. So... So a believer's best defense against slanderous criticism was good behavior. Make those accusations false by behaving properly. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It is the will of God. That's a strong term. See, apparently Christians were being accused of evil. But for Peter, it stressed that it is God's will... You know, thelema, term expressing the result of one's purpose or desire. It's God's will, and he's going to use that phrase all through this letter, as we'll get, get into it later. 
put to silence, through excellent behavior, they'll muzzle, if you will, the talk of ignorant men. The ignorance of community. Each of the three Greek words that are rendered here in the ignorant talk of foolish men, that's the way it's translated. But each one of the, the three Greek words start with alpha. Uh, they're rendered never perish, spoil, or fade. It's the same, the same thing that happens back there in, in, in verse 4 of chapter 1. But this, this always amuses me because apparently Peter enjoyed alliteration. I'm always amused. Somehow seminary, past, pastors graduate from seminary, seem to get, develop an affection for alliteration. Um, where every, they have four, you know, four, five key points and each one starts with the first letter. You know, and, and so on. And, uh, 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 they use the, the intention is that makes it mnemonically easier to remember it maybe, but it's a, it's a, it amuses me to see how some people are shackled to that particular motif, and so it's kind of interesting to see even Peter picks up on that with a deliberate alliteration here of the three Greek words, each starting with alpha. It gives it a, a punch, if you will. Moving on, as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Submission to lawful authority does not negate Christian liberty. You have liberty in Christ, yes, but that still should allow you then to submit to lawful authority. But you shouldn't use your liberty in Christ as a cloak for maliciousness, he's saying. Civil law should be freely obeyed, not out of fear, but because of doing so is God's will. So you don't, you, you don't keep the law to avoid being punished. You keep the law to have a good, good, good witness. Christian freedom is always conditioned by Christian responsibility. Galatians 5 deals with that. All through chapter Galatians 5. And you never use your liberty of Christ as a cloak for, or a cover-up, a veil, if you will, for some maliciousness or something of your own contrivance. Christian liberty should be conditioned by its Christian responsibility. Because you are the servants of God. Now, it's interesting here that the word here... Um, enjoy true freedom when they obey God and live as servants, slaves, if you will, the douloi of God. So even though you're living as free men, you should also live as God's slave. You, are, you may be free, a freeman in, in terms of our liberties that we enjoy here, but you're still a slave if you are God. You're purchased with a price. And it's interesting to me that Coeur d'Alene, where we live in French, means the heart of the all. All being like an ice pick or a because uh, uh, the intent was to give the Indian, the, the French Canadian trappers gave them a backhanded compliment, right? Treat, calling them sharp traitors. They had hearts of the all. Hearts of, but see, to, a, to a, someone biblically sensitive, that's the heart of the bond slave. The symbol of the bond slave was to pierce the ear to the doorpost when he bonded that house for the rest of his life, voluntarily, as a, as a commitment. And uh, so that's a doulos, is usually what it means. And, and, and John and Paul both use that term of themselves. They're bond slaves of Christ. And I was intrigued with that because that's what Coeur d'Alene actually is and conveys. But anyway, moving on. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now there's a mouthful. There's four punchy ones. This section concludes a four-point summary of the Christian uh, uh, citizenship. Four points. Honor all men. And uh, honor, value, esteem, respect, honor, and so forth. Pretty straightforward. Honor all men. Believers should be conscious of the fact that each human has been uniquely created in God's image. I've met several I've had some doubts about, but I'll yield the point. Okay. Love the brotherhood. Okay. Love the brotherhood of believers, their brothers and sisters in Christ, God's family members should love each other. That's pretty basic. Each one of these you could build a sermon on, but I don't think that's necessary here. Fear God. And the term here does not mean terror, but awe, reverence, the kind of reverence that leads to obedience. And uh, so it's uh, the same words used all through the New Testament. And one will never respect people until he reverences God. One of the problems we have in our culture that it takes us maybe slow to pick up on, we're used to, we've lived many, many decades, two centuries actually, in a culture that was God-fearing in general. They may not have agreed on all points of doctrine, of course, but they at least respected God in some way. 
what we fail to realize is in recent decades that has been stripped away with value relativism. You have your truth, I have mine kind of business. That's a form of rejecting. That's no longer God-fearing. Our, our freedoms come from God, not from the state. And uh, so the, the rejection of that heritage, we shouldn't be surprised when we see that rejected. The widespread corruption we see in the highest corridors of power. Whether you're talking about Wall Street, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury, the, 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 the musical chairs in that community, which eliminates any form of regulation. Or whether you look at the FDA, the American Medical Association, and the pharmaceutical industry, how that, those musical chairs eliminate a real... As you begin to realize the corruption that occurs that's brought upon us this real estate collapse and also the credit collapse that's engulfing the world is all has its roots in our failure to have effective regulation which in turn is a, 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 caused by an erosion of a God-fearing culture. They, they don't fear anything. Every man does what is right in his own eyes which in the Bible several many times is used as a symbol of the lowest depths you can in the book of Judges, to get across how deeply it fell, every man did what was right in his own eyes. That was an indictment, not a boast. Honor the king. And this is the honor, same thing that's used in the beginning of the verse here. The respect or honor due is all, is, should be given to those that God has placed in authority, whether it's king or governors or what have you. Okay, straightforward. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward servants. Now the Greek word here is not the doulos, the slaves, but rather it refers to a, a Greek term, okotai, which means a household or domestic servants. It's not quite the same, not the doulos that we're used to using here. But anyway, be subject to your masters, okay? Be subject to. It, 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 it really, it, it's a nominative participle that continues the idea of submission expressed in 1 Peter 2.13 uh, through the aorist imperative. And uh, to be subject to, to make it a continuing condition. Servants and slaves are made up, in those days, they were the majority of the population demographics. The high percentage of the early church, undeserved punishment and suffering was common for the underlings. So they were, they were abused, not surprised. So if, you're, if you subject yourself to a good and gentle master, you know what, no, of course, no problem. But here he's calling for them to be also subject to the ones that are abusive. The word froward. Those would be harsh. And uh, the Greek term means bent, not straight, curved. <laughs> In fact, that same Greek word is the word uh, scoliosis, which refers to the curvature of the spine. It comes from this word, to be bent. And we've all had masters that were bent. <laughs> okay. So... If this is thankworthy of man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, he, he, Peter sets forth a principle here that can be applied to any situation where unjust suffering occurs. If you have justified suffering, that's not the issue here. It's the unjust suffering. Okay? Peter goes on and says, What glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. See, no credit accrues for enduring punishment for doing wrong. You got what you deserved, right? It is respectful submission to undeserved suffering that finds favor with God because such behavior demonstrates His grace. Are you with me so far? Let me turn this coin over the other way. Do you realize that of the hurts and resentments you have, the ones that are the most dangerous are the ones that are the most justified. If somebody is, if you suffer an undeserved hurt, that's easier to get used to and dismiss because you can really admit to yourself that really wasn't, you know. But when you have a hurt that you feel is really justified, that's the kind of hurt that will bind you to that person. It's harder to break because it's a justified hurt. Do you follow me? Giving that over to God is tougher. Giving over the unjustified slander that's said about you, you can do that because you know it's unjustified. 
I'm speaking the, not to the outward, the inward aspect here. If you have a, a justified hurt, because, boy, that, you know, shouldn't have happened, and da 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 it's hard to let go. It's hard to leave that at the cross, isn't it? It's more essential that you do because as long as you have that hurt, it's a, it, it binds you. It binds you. But anyway, let's go on here. For even hereunto ye are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Peter powerfully supports his exhortation to, to the slaves by citing Christ's example of his endurance to unjust suffering. He was rejected. He was pure, but he, he, was, he was crucified. He came to fulfill God's promises. Talk about, wow. For here unto ye were, were ye called. So Christians are called, same words used to follow Christ, to emulate his character and conduct, because he suffered for us. Whatever you're suffering, it's less than he suffered for you. That's the net of it. Why? Because he served as an example. He left an example here. And the hippogramenum. It's an underwriting, if you will. The only place it appears in the New Testament. It, refer, it, it really refers to a draw, writing or drawing that a student reproduces, if you will. So, uh, in a sense, we are to be a carbon copy, if you will, of that. You should follow in his steps, is the idea. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And again, he's quoting from the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 9. Jesus committed no sin either before or during his suffering. He was sinless. He was completely innocent in both deed and word, without deceit. No deceit was found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know, it's astonishing when you look at the crucifixion and realize who he was. At any moment, boy, could he have set their clock. The creator of the universe was hanging on that cross. And they were making fun of him, abusing him physically, but also every other way. And uh, he reviled not again. You realize who he was, that's what's staggering. But he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Christ was a perfect example of patient submission of unjust suffering. That's the primary point that Peter's drawing upon here in the turn of the crucifixion. Humanly speaking, the provocation to retaliate during Christ's arrest, trial, and crucifixion was extreme. Yet he suffered in silence, committing himself to God. Why? Because he was in our shoes. He chose to be in our shoes. He left it to the Father to vindicate him in his good time. Is God going to set that record straight? You bet. You bet. And we need to also leave it to the Father. When we, when someone is reviling us or slandering us or whatever, we are to leave it to the Father. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Don't take it on yourselves. Peter continues, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live into righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. This is a widely misunderstood line, by the way. We're going to get into this here. Peter explains why the one whom could have destroyed his enemies with a word patiently endured the pain and humiliation of the cross. He bare our sins. See, he was in our shoes. He, had to leave it to, he, he left it to God because he had to, because he was in our shoes. God was justly judging our sins, which his son bore. He was made sin for us, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20. Strange word, strange passage, that the Holy One of God was made sin for us. You and I have no capacity to imagine what that really means. But he was. But he was. He didn't want to break the rope. Oh, now, now by who, uh, our sins... The Greek words, our sins, are near the beginning of the verse. Not in the English here, but in the Greek, it's the front of the thing, which is emphatic that way. In the Greek, that's, it's our sins. That's the, 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 the emphasis here. And uh, so, while he stresses Christ's personal involvement, it's our sins that's really the subject of that, that uh, clause. That we, being dead to sins, his death makes it possible for believers to be free from both the penalty and the power of sin and to live for him. 
That's the penalty of sin, death. And he, he paid that by dying. So we might die to sins and live for righteousness. That's the inversion that we're looking for. Romans 6 is your amplification of that whole issue. Christ suffered so that it would be possible for sin, Christians to follow His example both in suffering and righteous living. So don't misunderstand these stripes. We'll get to that here in a minute. By, his stri by whose stripes ye are healed. Peter is here talking about a general reference to salvation. By His wounds you have been healed. Of what? Of sin. This doesn't really refer to medical healing as some people try to apply it. I'm not disparaging it. I'm not saying that God doesn't heal. But that's not what the gr grammar is dealing with here. This does not refer to the physical healing. It's the verb's past tense that indicates a completed action. The healing that's an accomplished fact which occurred on the cross. Follow me? Important. Because that sometimes is misapplied. Okay, it goes beyond the grammar, in other words. By whose stripes we're healed. The references to salvation, Christ's stripes, I, a, wound, a stripe left by a lash, referred to Jesus' scourging and death accomplished the healing, the salvation of every individual who trusts in Him as a Savior. That's the thrust and focus of Peter's thought here. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't heal. But that's not what this is focusing on. This is talking about salvation. And He's taking those stripes that give us our salvation. For we, as sheep, are going astray. There's again a quote from Isaiah 53. For we, as sheep, going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our souls. That's quite a term, the shepherd and bishop. He not only, Christ not only served as an example and provides salvation, but He also continues to give guidance and protection to those who are headed away, like sheep going astray, in other words. Rather than return, that, that, that uh, he, he gets them turned about. It's, it's like, like, uh, like uh, he keeps us in the flock, if you will. It keeps us from straying too far. To the shepherd and overseer. From, the whole concept of shepherd and overseer here is one of continual accountability, continue, continued guidance, if you will. Yes, he did it once and for all on the cross, but he also continues as our shepherd and bishop of our souls. And that's his, his guidance and management of those who commit themselves to his care. If you committed him, have you committed yourself to his care? Then he's your shepherd, he's your bishop, he's the one you rely on. Okay. Now we finished the first section of a three-section letter. We're, next time we're going to study First Peter chapter three. Now, this chapter you're going to enter is going to be astonishingly parallel to the challenges you and I are going to be facing over the next few weeks and months. You and I are entering into an era of history of our country that is going to be markedly different than it's been for the last two centuries. Because uh, for a lot of reasons we'll talk about as we go. Um, one of the other passages that we're going to be dealing with in another study, but it's relevant in the same flavor, is our study of Hosea, from you know, especially from chapter 4 on in Hosea. It deals with a set of series uh, conditions that I think are very distinctively the ones we're facing in the future. But chapter 3 of 1 Peter will remarkably be sensitive to this as you go through it and do your study for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.